Welcome back. This is part three of the chapter 14 lecture over Gregor Mendel. Um, we left off talking about codominance. Now we're switching gears talking about multiple alleles. So when we see more than two alleles, like our a ABO blood groups, uh, when we see that, then uh, we're going to see a specific inheritance pattern. And, and let me, let me kind of get into the weeds a little bit. Uh, with, with the blood groups. So the result is there are going to be multiple genotypes and phenotypes. Uh, like it says on the screen there, it's really common and it seems like it muddies the water. It seems like the math doesn't work well until you get the patterns to fit right. So with our blood types, we've got AB, A, comma, B, comma, AB, and then O. What determines your blood type, of course, is your genotype. So if you've got homozygous A, so uh, before I get into that, this notation, don't be confused by this notation, this means chromosome gene, chromosome gene. You've probably seen sex linked crosses where you had like an X and, a, and an A or something like that, same notation. Okay, so we've got uh, IAIA or IA recessive. Okay, so notice that these are, there's no lowercase a, there's no lowercase b. When these genes are present, they're going to be expressed. This is the recessive version. The lowercase i is a recessive version. You also might see a notation capital I O. That's kind of a newer notation from the lowercase i. Um, it's something, just, just be aware that there are two different ways to notate that, lowercase i or I O. Either one is acceptable. When we look at the blood types, again, the A allele is going to make, in this picture, it's going to make triangles. The B allele is going to make bubbles. The, the lowercase i makes none. And so what, what I'm talking about when I say um, triangles and bubbles, these are um, carbohydrate receptors that are on the outside of blood cells. So if you've got the A allele, you've got triangles. If you've got the B allele, you've got bubbles. If you've got A, B, you have both. It's not, they're not bubbly triangles or pointy bubbles. They're codominant. They're dominating together. Both capital letters, both being expressed. If you're the double recessive, homozygous recessive, then you have no receptors on the outside of your blood cells. This is important, <coughs> excuse me, important because if I have type A blood, then I have molecules and, and uh, white blood cells in my body that will attack anything that doesn't have triangle receptors. So if I get a blood transfusion that has that, that's type B blood, my body's going to attack it. But if I'm type AB, hmm, I can't attack bubbles, I can't attack triangles, so I must be able to accept any kind of blood. And then if I'm type O, everybody can accept me because there are no receptors for uh, for the antigens to bind to. Um, this is something that we're going to talk through in class, so I don't even want to spend a ton of time on it. Um, but this, it essentially shows we use anti-type uh, A and anti-type B um, chemicals to cause coagulation. And let, let me, it's always neater when, when it's a drawn image instead of the actual image. So what you're seeing <clears throat> is that it, it basically what gets broken down. Like I said, we'll, we'll talk about that in class. I don't, I don't, this setting doesn't make sense to really talk through that, so we'll get to it. Um, you also probably have heard that you're O positive, A negative, something along those lines. That's, that's called the rhesus factor, completely separate from ABO blood groups. That is truly a Mendelian trait dominant recessive. It's either there or it isn't. It's an extra receptor that, that's that's on your blood cells. So if you're A positive, you have one extra receptor. You're positive for that receptor. If you're A negative, you're negative for that receptor, so you don't have it. So when you say you're A positive, that's that's truly a dihybrid trait, and you can do it as a dihybrid cross, and we will do it as a dihybrid cross uh, here in just a little bit. Not a little bit, this week sometime. Uh, epistasis occurs uh, where one gene influences a second gene. Um, that's pretty rare, but it definitely does happen, um, <clears throat> tends to happen in, um, we see a lot in fur color. 
uh, things like gerbils and hamsters and things like that. Uh, multiple genes ex affect the expression of, of other genes. Um, so here you see that uh, this is specific to gerbils. Uh, big C is color, little c is albino, big B is brown, little b is black. So if they get a little c, it doesn't matter what these others are. They're not going to be expressed. If they get a big C, then this matters. Some pictures of gerbils. They're different colors. There's a black, and there's brown, there's albino. So we're getting color, we're getting no color. There's our uh, cross. So we know that we're going to have brown in F1. If we have nine brown, we know that they got a big C and they got a big B. We don't know for sure what the other alleles are because they, they are the dominant trait. The three blacks, we know they got a color, so they got a big C, and they're black, so they must have two little Bs. And then the albinos, we don't know what the black-brown color is because they're, they're white, so they got the albino locus. Albino trait, I'm sorry, not locus. Uh, so this throws off all kinds of ratios and makes it really difficult to uh, identify what's going on from a genetic perspective. You got to just keep grinding and keep after the the math until uh, until you get there. Last but not least, I think, is polygenic inheritance, and you're going to learn a ton, a ton about polygenic inheritance uh, here in just a couple of months when we go uh, on our field trip uh, and hear Dr. Sam Ryan talk. He's he's a leading expert on polygenic inheritance. Um, something that has really blown up over the last 15 years and, and it is what it sounds like it's poly so it's many genes influencing one trait um, and, and any trait that has a range of traits I'm sorry that's a circuitous statement um, but any anything that has a range of possibilities is going to be polygenic inheritance I mentioned human height earlier human weight same thing, blood pressure, skin color. These are all things that there's definitely no either or. It's a, it's a gradient that always points to polygenic inheritance. Um, skin color is controlled by at least four genes. And think about it this way. You're making Kool-Aid. You fill a jar with water. It's clear. You open up one packet and dump it in there and it gets, maybe you're making red Kool-Aid, so it turns a little bit pink. You dump a second packet in there, it gets a little bit redder. Third, fourth, fifth, sixth packet, you're getting some dark red Kool-Aid. Maybe diabetes also, but <laughs> the idea is every packet that you add makes the Kool-Aid a little bit darker. Same thing is true of our genes. Every gene that you turn on makes us a little darker. This person has, notice we've got uh, three on, three off. It's possible that they have a baby that has all six off. It's also possible that they have a baby that has all six on. And we can do a Punnett square for this, but there are 64 cells and we, we don't want to do that for darn sure. But um, this shows the range of skin colors. And this is also I, I, I had a friend who, uh, not, I'm sorry, not a friend, my cousin, is white. She had a an African-American boyfriend, I think. <clears throat> they had a baby, and the baby, when it was very first born, he was white. And so there was a big, I don't know, everybody was always like, oh, is this is this really his son, or has she been cheating on him, or something like that? And they did paternity testing, and it came back, yes, this is your kid. You guys are the parents of this kid. She wasn't, che well, we don't know she was cheating on you, but this isn't the product of her cheating on you. Um, it, it's just, it's the way the genes worked out. Your kid had fewer genes turned on than you do. So you're darker, he's lighter. So the result to this is we get, we get a range, we get a range. Mendelian ratios fail completely. Uh, traits definitely run in families because you're in, inheriting multiple genes. Um, so, uh, yeah. So offspring are often intermediates between parental types. So that would be where my cousin and her boyfriend expected uh, a, a, maybe a light-skinned African American baby or a dark, dark white baby or something like that, and it just didn't. It's, you're not always a blend, but sometimes you are. 
Um, one dead giveaway that polygenic inheritance is going on is if you plot your traits and there's a bell curve. That almost always indicates that polygenic inheritance is going on. We often study human uh, genetics in, in pedigrees because of that gestation period I mentioned earlier. Uh, it takes nine months to go from one generation to the next. Uh, there are a small number of offspring. We don't have litters of, of pups or uh, we, our, our, our seed doesn't get spread everywhere and, and pollinate lots of, of different plants or something like that. And then we have a long lifespan. So, uh, And then, of course, on top of that, there are the ethics involved with doing genetic testing on, on humans. So um, it's important that you be able to interpret a pedigree chart. Pedigrees are basically family trees. Um, and, and the symbols are that squares are males, circles are females. If you have the trait, you're filled in. So a female with the trait would be a solid white circle. Um, I use black on printouts so that you can tell uh, what's filled in. Sometimes you'll see um, a heterozygote marked as a half-filled box or a half-filled female. That's not always the case, but some pedigrees uh, do that. Here's a sample of a pedigree. Uh, affected male, unaffected female, affected female, unaffected, unaffected, unaffected. So this would be parents and offspring. I'm assuming this is twins. That's usually what it means when they branch out from the same point. This is a more traditional, uh, two more traditional uh, uh, pedigrees, I'm sorry. Um, I, I got thrown for a loop here because I, I, I hate this I hate this slide. Um, you'll understand why when we talk about the ethics of teaching Mendelian inheritance, but uh, both of these are, neither of these are Mendelian traits. Attached and unattached and widow's peak is, is not a Mendelian trait. It does not follow Mendelian inheritance. Again, because there's a range. It's not like if you have a widow's peak, it looks exactly like that. If you don't, it looks exactly like that. Or if you have attached, they look exactly like that. And if they're free, they look... No, there's a range. There are really far widow's peaks that go down almost to your eyebrows, and then there are little tiny ones, kind of like she has. So we know that can't be Mendelian inheritance. When I was in school, we got taught all this stuff as Mendelian. And that's, that's changed gradually. There are still a lot of teachers that teach it wrong. I've taught with, with many teachers that teach it wrong. Um, but anyway, we're talking about the pedigree here, not the genetics of it. Notice the filled-in individuals are, are, are affected. The unaffected individuals are not shaded in. Okay, so transitioning to recessive disorders. Um, you guys are going to do research, as you know, on, on your inquiries. So I'm not going to spend a ton of time on these, but there are tons of recessive disorders out there. Uh, there are some listed on the screen. Um, Sickle cell is one that, that merits a little bit of discussion. Um, so it, it's really common in uh, folks from uh, that have a family base in Africa. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about why that is. Um, it's a single amino acid substitution that, that causes hemoglobin to not work properly. It, it changes the shape of hemoglobin, so it doesn't allow it to accept oxygen quite as well. Definitely can carry less oxygen. Um, there's, there's an NFL player right now that has trouble every time he goes to Denver because the elevation is higher and he has he carries the sickle cell trait. Um, and so he struggles uh, whenever he has to play there. He, he goes through special treatments and, um, and has to be monitored really, really closely to make sure that he doesn't pass out from lack of oxygen. Um, it is co-dominance in its inheritance pattern. And um, you kind of see this picture here. What's interesting and, and what causes it to be really common amongst folks of African, African heritage is that uh, if you're a heterozygote for um, uh, a sickle cell, you're, the sickled cells also can't carry uh, malaria. So it makes you immune to malaria. So it's what's called a heterozygote advantage. Tay-Sachs is another one. Uh, if you've seen Lorenzo's oil, that's about Tay-Sachs. It's really common in Jewish populations. Anytime you, you have a population that marries within itself, you're going to have an increase in recessive uh, diseases and disorders like Tay-Sachs. Brain cells can't break down lipids, so brain, lipids build up in the brain, and the, the, the child usually dies by two or three years old. Uh, at the oldest. So that's the end of, of video three. We'll wrap up with video four here in just a minute.